Look, there are lots of things that can be released. Prisoners of war, bombs, the hounds. But AWS decided instead, ah, we're going to release a whole bunch of features and or services. I was wondering what the difference is, so I did a little digging. And as best I can tell, the difference between an AWS service and a feature is how ambitious the person responsible for it is. Because if they make it a feature, it gets promoted. They've also got to be charismatic or at least politically astute. But realistically, we're, we're talking not about a service strategy. We're talking about an org chart. Conway's Law, alive and well. Let's explore some of these monstrosities they've released to inflict upon us, the customer. VPC Lattice launched, which is a network overlay. It solves a bunch of problems for customers. Like, it's really hard to have an application layer network that doesn't get stuck on all of the intricacies of what it takes to wind its way through the AWS network. That's a big problem. Another problem, albeit one for AWS, was that there was no way for them to charge per gigabyte on traffic between two instances sitting right the freak next to each other in the same subnet. Now, Thanks to the magic that is VPC Lattice, you can take these things and make them into Lattice Notes. That should better be pronounced as Lotus Notes. That joke absolutely kills it for those of you listening in 1995, software friends. Yeah. Now, you take your Lotus Notes and they now wind up being charged two and a half cents per gigabyte on traffic that is passing between them. That said, it does make the networking story dramatically simpler when it comes to applications. And for many use cases, this is easily going to be well worth the money. No contest. The problem is it's not going to work out that way when you're, you know, replicating a few petabytes between two adjacent instances. Most things are dangerously expensive when you hold them incorrectly, like Fabergé eggs or someone else's baby. AWS supply chain came out and it's like, well, huh, what do we need? Supplies. Yeah, the worst party planning ever. Great. Now, I'm not a supply chain guy because I am bad at remembering to go to the post office to mail out my holiday cards, let alone anything worse. There's no doubt that Amazon itself is great at logistics. But that's kind of a problem. I mean, I just went to an Amazon conference and I spent a staggering amount of time there waiting in a whole bunch of lines. But okay, fine. Are they going to be able to overcome their it's Amazon reticence well enough to dive into this? I don't know the answer. I'm not in that industry vertical, but I'm very curious to find out. AWS Application Composer. Strange name, not to be confused with Deep Composer, and that's gonna mess with me a little bit, but fortunately I don't have to. This seems to be the rebirth of Stackery, a company that did something vaguely similar that got aqua hired by AWS. So what I'm calling this instead is Amazon Basics Stackery. Now, Amazon Basics Stackery is incredibly interesting to me. It's Visual Basic for designing applications. Drag, drop, tie them together. Now today, it's heavily biased for serverless services, but I can see it expanding into a whole lot more use cases. I mean, the best way to picture this thing is, imagine designing your architecture on a whiteboard. Cool, now slap a little bit of code onto it and you can run the whiteboard diagram. Congratulations, your whiteboard is now a critical path on production. So, that's great, but now your crappy drawing comes to life and works. Well, I assume it's crappy because mine are crappy. I can't draw. I'm sure you have amazing skills of an artist. Bully for you. The important thing is, is that this unlocks significant opportunities to rapidly prototype, to get something out the door without requiring a full development team to do it. Event Bridge Pipes came out and I wasn't quite sure what it was, but that's okay. I don't need to know what it is. All I have to know is what it isn't because it's defined by what it's not. This is no pipe. EventBridge is one of those things that honestly, I've been sleeping on for way too long. I seem to recall it came out of the IoT side of the world, IoT events, which I always viewed as, well, it's clearly not for me since I don't do IoT work. Apparently, AWS still needs to learn that words mean things. Now I look at it in a bit more depth and it seems, oh, it's an event bus that ties together the entire AWS service universe. And that is an incredibly powerful thing that is almost certainly capable of doing an awful lot. 
I intend to use it as a database, which is absolutely not what anyone should do, but that never stops me. I can't wait until 2023 when I get some spare time to build monstrosities. Security can be profoundly depressing, which is why AWS released Amazon Security Lake. It's dual purpose. You can both store all of your security data from various sources within it for easy analysis and querying, and you can also use it to drown yourself. In data, come on, I'm not quite that dark yet. I still have a little bit of hope left. That's, that'll come out next reInvent. For ages as a customer, I've wanted an API where I can just stuff data into something and then use that API to search through that data. A lot of people want that. I was excited when they announced Amazon OpenSearch serverless until I saw that at its smallest setting, you're still paying $700 a month for it and you have to basically allocate the number of CPU dinguses that it needs. Now, that ain't no serverless I ever heard of. Words mean things. If not, we're just going to call EC2 serverless and be done with it. Hello, McFly. Ah. Uh. Amazon Code Catalyst is impressive and long overdue. The problem isn't that there are 17 ways to run containers on AWS. It's trying to figure out which one is the most appropriate slash best to use for a given project. And then you have to make that same decision with all of the various CI CD options, databases, and a dozen other structural questions. And now you're deep into the weeds of analysis by paralysis. Code Catalyst is opinionated. It spins up scaffolding around a new application and then integrates with almost any local IDE you'd like. So you don't have to take their opinion on that. Personally, my favorite IDE to use locally is Microsoft Word. I can't wait to kick the tires on this thing. AWS Wicker is now available. It's Amazon Chime, except it's completely separate and has no conception of each other because this is AWS beginning to take a page from Google's messaging service strategy playbook. Now, I don't know who the product owner for this thing is over at AWS, but I would desperately love to meet him just so I can get all of the Wicker Man puns out of my system. AWS Backup supports CloudFormation Stacks. Now, to be clear, it's not just the CloudFormation stack itself. Come on, that's not hard. It's a single file in YAML or JSON. Anyone can back that up, stuff it into Git, get on with your day. No, it also understands that thing and it backs up all of the data stores defined within the stack. I probably will not be the only person who uses this to migrate an application between AWS accounts. I'm serious, I've been stalling on doing that for the better part of a decade now because it's obnoxious, finicky, painful, and doesn't add a whole lot of direct value. What do I do instead? I sit around and I whine about it. AWS Stimface Weaver, Space Sim Weaver, Sim Space, screw it, AWS Spider Bro. Cool. AWS Spider Bro is a convoluted name because it's basically the foundation for what could be called AWS Metaverse. Now, the idea of a metaverse is something that I assure you I find no less cringy than you do. That said, large-scale simulations featuring a million people at city scale are incredibly useful for a whole boatload of use cases. Unfortunately, today, those use cases are very large-scale and thus expensive, along with being incredibly niche. As a result, unless you're trying to work out improved emergency responder routes through a city or imagining traffic flow across all of the reInvent venues simultaneously, this thing sounds like a solution desperately in search of a problem. It has those problems already. The, ch the challenge here is that it's just not problems that most of us have. This is the unfortunate narrative byproduct of AWS's increased focus on industry vertical differentiation into spaces where no one believes or understands what's going on because they're there for Amazon Web Services. That's an inaccurate name. IoT and supply chain are great examples of something that is not itself a web service. So why are we talking about them here? Who is this for? That is the question that AWS is still struggling to answer for an awful lot of things. AWS obviously launched a whole bunch of new EC2 instance types and sizes, and they named them things in typical fashion like C7GN, R7IZ, and HPC7G. In fact, 
One of the many other instance types that was announced has a weirdly convoluted name. That's because it spells out the name of the person you should have married instead if your life had become what it was supposed to have been. So reInvent had a different tone this year. It had huge attendee numbers, like before the pandemic, but it also, probably due to recession fears, had remarkably fewer sponsors. As a result, it's pretty clear that there were a bunch of budget crunches and things where corners started to get cut. Canceling Midnight Madness, for example, was kind of maddening. You had thousands upon thousands of people who were in town, nothing else to do, and nobody bothered to throw a vendor party or, hey, come on down for board game night or something. I'm not saying they were responsible for doing things because people found things to do, but it was definitely a lost opportunity. The pacing for most of reInvent was very strange. I mean, most of the releases tended to come on Thursday, not toward the start of the event or on Tuesday in Adam's keynote. So as a result, it felt like it really hampered everyone's ability to talk to AWS folks about the new things that had launched that were directly impactful to the things that they were building. It feels like reInvent is not necessarily what it once was in that it's not for the people building things, primarily web services, for SaaS style use cases or e-commerce or things like that. It's now factory floors and industry verticals and, and that's okay. It cannot and should not be all things to all folks. But it really felt like instead of throwing a dedicated industry conference, they threw that onto this thing too. So it became an education conference, a sales conference, a giant feature dump, and no one really knew what to expect at any given point. Like nine o'clock at Sunday night, instead of Midnight Madness, a whole bunch of releases just showed up without any real fanfare or announcement. It, I don't understand the thinking that went behind it. Look, I get it, logistics are incredibly hard, but if you're going to spend extortionate amounts of money, time, and energy to get everyone's attention and all eyes turn to you, it really is imperative that you have something to say. And I don't know what AWS is saying to us this year. I'll have to think about it some more and see what happens. But all in all, if you weren't at reInvent and were regretting missing out, if it's any cold comfort, I don't think you necessarily missed a whole lot.